Welcome back to the channel. My name is Jeff. This is Not Just Book Reviews. And today I'm going to be talking about the novel Legend by David Gemmel, written in, published, I should say, in 1984. So David Gemmel is a writer whom I've, I've known of for a long time. Um, even back in the 80s when I was reading fantasy, um, I thought the Drenai series, Legend, uh, Waylander, like these titles were around. Um, but for one reason or another, I never got around to reading him. He's been on my to-be-read list probably for many decades, I should say. <clears throat> so finally, I think I saw a few reviewers talking about him. I think Michael K. Vaughn reviewed him. Brian Lee Durfee did a brief review and did a whole um, view of his uh, David Gemmel book collection. And I just was like, ah, oh, yeah, Gemmel. I've never, never really read him. And went back and just looked around and the reviews for, for Legend were mostly pop, you know, positive. So I gave it a shot. And I was very surprised. I liked it. Um, I liked it a lot. So I'm going to talk into some detail about it. Uh, so I'm going to give basically the story set up. I'll try to do a spoiler-free, mostly review if I can. Uh, and I'll warn if I'm going to do some heavy-duty spoilers. So I'm just going to read kind of the setup to the book. Um, <clears throat> there's the actual David Gemmel wiki, uh, which I got this from, which is actually really great because uh, his world of the Drenai, uh, I think there's like 12, 13 books uh, in the series now. It's a pretty realized world. Um, not, you know, through-lined, but more like a trilogy here, two books there, or a book here, but all in the same universe and different time periods. So um, this is kind of his Drenai world. I think he's got two or three other little mini universes that he's done a series on. But anyway, this is the, the, the Drenai. So this is the setup for the book. Um, the Nadir Horde of Ulrich the Uniter has conquered several northern nations and prepares for an invasion southward into Drenai territory with an army of half a million warriors. The fate of the Drenai Empire hangs on the defense of Dros del Nok, a fortress guarding a mountain pass into Drenai lands. If the fortress can hold for three months, the Drenai army may be able to muster a force capable of repelling the Nadir invasion. But the Drenai army has dwindled during the reign of Lord Abelin, and the Del Nok garrison has been reduced to less than 10,000 men under the leadership of Abilene's incompetent nephew, Orin. Del Nar, the ailing Earl of Bronze, calls upon the aid of Dross the Legend, the titular legend, I should say. I love that word, titular. Um, calls on the aid of Dross the Legend, an aging hero coming out of retirement for one final battle, and the 30 an order of warrior priests who serve the source, which is kind of the magic system in this world, by fighting to the death when summoned to a worthy cause. Okay, so that's basically the setup. Um, in a nutshell, to me, what makes this book really is character. This was uh, David Gemmel's first book. He was uh, a journalist before then, um, lives in England, obviously, but was a journalist for years. I think wrote a lot of this maybe 15 years or so before it was published, cobbled it together. And, you know, at some point, I think he was very lukewarm on being a fantasy author. So he, I guess he got the story to a certain point. He threw it at an editor. What do you think of this? And uh, the person was like, oh, my God, let's clean this up. This is good. You should publish this. And so Legend became his first book. So as a first author. I mean, I don't think he wrote any short stories that he published before this. He was writing pure journalism, I think, up until then. So what's good about it is character. Uh, the characters in this book are terrific and kind of reminded me similarly of um, the Belgaria, not in, in tone and style. It's a very different book, but I kind of came out of the Belgaria. I'd like, it is what it is, but boy, the characters are a lot of fun to be with. And I'm kind of the same with Legend, where there's a lot of flaws the setup isn't entirely super original. A lot of what happens plot-wise isn't over the moon. But you really hook into the characters. And by the end of the book, you're really invested. Um, and Gemmel's kind of a bit George R.R. R. Martin with his characters. Pre-Martin, actually. So, uh, you know, not, not all of them uh, stick around until the end of the book, which is refreshing, frankly. So what I think makes the book work, uh, our character, there's a gritty realism that you wouldn't expect to find in books of the 80s or 90s in fantasy. 
Um, <clears throat> so that really works. Kind of sometimes it feels very much like historical fiction novel, you know, with the amount of research and the amount of kind of realism that, that it speaks to it sometimes. Um, so that really helps a lot. And what detracts from the book really is um, a bit of first-time writer's clumsiness with putting the whole thing together. So I'll get into that a little bit as I go. Um, but I want to talk about, at the very beginning, I want to talk about the characters because they make, they're the soul and heart of this book. Um, and obviously, we should talk about the titular character, Druss the Legend. So Druss is this classic, you know, greatest warrior of his age, coming out of retirement for one last battle, right? I mean, what, what more cliche could you possibly get? Um, and he's ripe for cliche, but from the outset, uh, he really is not. He's a really wonderful character, uh, a viewpoint character to follow around. Um, and what's great about Druss is his, he's a mouthpiece for Gemmel, who I think has done an enormous amount of research, not just really about uh, medieval warfare, which he obviously has done, but I think he's done a lot of reading about men and war and some of the myths about war and some of the realities of war. And so Dross is kind of the old grizzled veteran kind of laying it down for uh, a lot of younger characters who are like, oh my, you know, who are still into like full glory, looking for glory, thinking war is this wonderful thing. The wonderful paradox about Dross is that for all of his uh, you know, realistic downplaying of like, yeah, it, it's not, you know, it's horrible and it's this and it's that. He's kind of compelled to be a warrior and to fight. So it makes for a very interesting clash, I think, which makes for a nice, well-rounded character. Um, so I wanted to read a, a quote from one part of the book that just, I, I think, sums up uh, Druss wonderfully. Basically, what, what's happening at the beginning is when Druss gets the call to come defend this, um, this keep, he kind of wanders through the countryside briefly trying to find allies. And he goes into taverns. Um, people recognize him. People don't recognize him. They mistake him. You know, he shows his prowess as a warrior. And he's basically a very noble character. So he's, he inspires the hell out of people. And he inspires a whole bunch of people to come with him to fight, which is this losing battle. kind of. And this is the theme of this book is that um, what is it like to be someone who's committed to fighting a losing battle? You know, they're, they're kind of doomed to lose this battle. Not Just Book Reviews, brought to you by Yeti. They keep shit warm pretty long. Okay, anyway. Um, so he's going through the countryside, he's finding allies, and uh, as he's, he has these speeches, basically, that he gives at times, which in endear men to him and it's mostly men let's frank let's be fair frank so <clears throat> here's one of his uh, speeches when someone's asking him you know why what why bother quote a man needs many things in his life to make it bearable a good woman sons and daughters comradeship warmth food and shelter but above all these things he needs to be able to know that he is a man and what is a man he is someone who rises when life has knocked him down. He is someone who raises his fist to heaven when a storm has ruined his crop and then plants again and again. A man remains unbroken by the savage twists of fate. That man may never win, but when he sees himself reflected, he can be proud of what he sees. For lo, he may be in the scheme of things, peasant, serf, or dispossessed, but he is unconquerable. And what is death? An end to trouble, an end to strife and fear. I have fought in the many battles. I have seen many men die, and women too. In the main, they die proud. Bear this in mind as you decide your future. So, <clears throat> what a great, you know, it's great. It's just, it's, he's a great noble character. This is kind of like heroic fiction, right? This is not grimdark. Uh, in that it's gritty and realistic in a lot of ways, but it is also not, from what I know of Grimdark, it's like, it's not about kind of noble things. Like most people are kind of just, it's almost like film noir in the fantasy setting, kind of what I think it is. I've read very little of it, but that's how it feels from the, um, how I see, hear people talk about it and how it's reviewed. Um, I don't think it's noble and heroic in any way. Um, but this is very much heroic fiction, but done in a very gritty way. So anyway, 
Dress has a lot of those speeches and they don't get old because they don't really repeat and he has them at certain times and certain places that are, I don't know, it's just very entertaining and uh, you're kind of waiting for the next time Dress is going to throw down and kind of lay out a speech. So, And he's a very compelling character because of it. In addition to his near immortality as a fighter, I mean, the guy's probably pushing 70, nobody beats him one-on-one. -on -one. He's, he's like, that's his thing. Like that is his, you know, being the legend that he kind of possesses this ability to fight in battle. Um, but it's imbued with this other sensibility of, of wisdom and kind of darkness in a way that just makes him really a great character. Okay, then you have the other kind of the male protagonist who I think the book kind of is laying the protagonist's mantle on, although I, he's, he's much less of an interesting character than a lot of other people in this book, and that's Regnak the Wanderer. So Rek is this soldier. You, you, you start off the book with him kind of in a tavern, drunk, He's running from the army because he knows that, uh, you know, the, the nadir. It's very funny that he names, you know, this is a young writer. To name a horde like the nadir, you know, like the very lowest of the low is your enemy, right? Okay. Got it. Got it, Dave. Anyway, he's, you know, he's smart. And he's like, screw this, man. They're going to lose. I'm out of here. But on the way, he just, some woman is being beset by bandits in, uh, in the wilderness and he steps in and saves her. And it turns out she is the Earl of this keep, this Dross Delnock, the same guy who asked Dross to come defend the keep, uh, you know, asked her to kind of come as well. And uh, she's on her way there. He doesn't know this, any of this, she doesn't reveal any of this, but he falls in love with her. Um, and because of her now decides he'll go with her and he'll fight. So because, because his kind of will is about her, I don't know. There's something about him. He's not really well written. They fall in love really quickly. I'll get to that. Some of the criticisms I have, but the only interesting thing about him is that he's a berserker, and the the book <laughs> does not, you know, does not disguise this. Uh, he's a berserk, b a r e s a r k, right? But it's like it's a berserker, like the berserker Viking warriors. Who I'm not exactly sure how they got them into this berserk place but maybe they got them all drugged up or war pain or something and sent them into the battle to just go nuts and probably get killed you know by the end of it but so when he goes into this state he's kind of you know unkillable in a way he's he's unbelievable so he's kind of discovering this about himself it's almost like he's a werewolf and he becomes this thing but other than that not a very interesting guy uh vire the woman who he falls in love with actually is a little more interesting than him and she's a little more compelling first of all because she she has a want. Rex kind of like, I'm in love with you. I'll do whatever you want to do. And later on, he's kind of a good warrior. So we kind of like him. But she's like, I know this is a lost cause. Because he's like, why are you going there? It's a lost cause. And she's like, because I have to go. And my father lives there. And I'm going to do this thing. So she's brave, actually. She has some charisma and bravery about her. So we kind of like her. Um, uh, then of all the, of the other characters, when um, Druss gets there, the guy kind of running the place is called Gan Oren, and Gan, G-A-N, is kind of a, something they put in front of the name. Uh, there's Gan Oren, there's Gan Hogan. It's some kind of regional title. Uh, you become a Gan. I don't know where Gimel got it from. There's probably something in the in medieval history that corresponds. But anyway, and I like this character because he's when you when you get there, he's kind of like a coward. None of the men respect him. They, they feel like as soon as the nadir appear, he's going to try to make back alley deals. So no one, the morale is really low. But the great thing about him is that he recognizes it very quickly uh, when Druss gets there. And they have this wonderful conversation. So I wanted to read uh, this moment. And again, this is so much about why I'm really liking David Gemmel. It's my first Gemmel book. But, um, and later on when I talk about, you know, more of the things that I liked about the book, I'll talk about it's these kinds of um, kind of bare bones conversations between characters, right? So this is really great. Um, so this is him thinking about himself. Quote, as soon as he had heard Druss had arrived, he had prepared for the certainty that he would be replaced, sent back to Drenan in disgrace. Now he was being offered a lifeline. He should have thought of raising the buildings and blocking the tunnels. He knew it just as he knew he was miscast as a Gan. It was a hard fact to accept. 
Throughout the last five years since his elevation, he had avoided self-examination. However, only days before, he had sent Horgan and 200 of his Legion Lancers into the Outlands. At first, he had held to the belief that it was a sensible military decision. But as the days had passed and no word came, he had agonized over his orders. It had little to do with strategy, but everything to do with jealousy. Hogan, he had realized with sick horror, was the best soldier in the dross. When he had returned and told Orin that his decision had proved the wise one, far from bolstering Orin, it had finally opened his eyes to his own inadequacy. He had considered resigning, but could not face the disgrace. He had even contemplated suicide, but could not bear the thought of the dishonor it would bring to his uncle. All he could do was die on the first wall, and this he was prepared for. I have been a fool, Druss, he said at last. Enough of that talk, snapped the old man. Listen to me, you are the Gan. From this day on, no man will speak ill of you. What you fear, keep to yourself and believe in me. Everyone makes mistakes, everyone fails at something. The dross will hold, for I will be damned if I will let it fall. If I had felt you were a coward, Orin, I would have tied you to a horse and sent you packing. You have never been in a siege or led a troop into battle. Well, now you will do both and do it well, for I will be beside you. End quote. So there's this great moment of like, you know, in other books, you know, I feel like in other fantasy books to create drama, Gan Oren would have like gone over to the enemy and they wouldn't have known it until the end or Gan Oren would have been like cunning and tried to undercut Dross because he was jealous. Like there would have been all this other stuff, which is great for drama. Like a lot of times when there's, you know, characters in books, as soon as you meet them, you kind of know what they're going to be like. And you recognize that for certain writers, it's easy drama. Um, to make certain characters certain things and at this stage of the game reading books in like, you know, the 21st century It's also very boring and uninteresting when you come across characters who you just like, oh, okay He's the spy. This is gonna be the bad guy This is the guy who's gonna just be annoying until he gets killed and gets his comeuppance This is the guy who whatever so I feel like Gemmel also from the outset was kind of upending conventions Guys were talking about death and cowardice and having these conversations, which I really liked the rest of the characters, I won't go into too much. You have the Ulrich, the, the, the main bad guy who's on his way here with his horde. Basically, um, he is crafted upon uh, Genghis Khan uh, and the Mongol invasion, which basically, you know, almost conquered Europe, except for uh, a throne succession that happened back in Mongolia, which really stopped it. So you can tell right away that he kind of is, is modeling that, the, uh, the nadir on the Mongols, which is fine. Dross comes upon some archers on the way to Dross, um, and uh, <laughs> it's kind of goofy, but the Ro he's kind of a Robin Hood character because he's out in the forest with a bunch of other outlaws, and they're all archers, like, hello, who would this be? And the guy's called Bowman. <laughs> so it's like, really, Gemmel? What did you, did you completely give up? You know, like, what am I going to name this guy? He's a good archer. He's out in the country. I can't name him Robin Hood. Ah, Bowman. All right, that's good. So it's a little weird. Anyway, he picks them up. Um, and then there are a couple of characters who are kind of our Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, as, as it were, are uh, kind of guys in the trenches uh, called Gilad and Bregan. And uh, he uses these as kind of voices from the guys on the front lines and they're bickering, they're old friends and they're bickering amongst each other. But you're getting kind of a, a, a bird's eye view of what it's like just to be. These guys were farmers drafted into the army and what that experience is like, uh, which is he brings a lot of realism into it, which, I, which is great. So those are the main characters, um, and most of them are very interesting and fun to read. Uh, I really like them a lot. So overall, I would say a lot of the things I liked about this book, um, a lot of frank conversations about being a legend, about being in war. Uh, again, I found it startling that this book was written in 1984 because the surrounding stuff was David Eddings and Shannara um, and, you know, other fantasies and... Um, uh, Spell Singer and God Give Real K, you know, uh, and here is this fantasy that reads like it could be from the Hundred Years War. Um, really, really gritty, um, which was great uh, at the time. So really kind of surprised and bad. And he does it really well. Um, and there are these wonderful conversations between, uh, there's a couple of conversations between the main bad guy Ulrich and Dross. There, there are these lulls in the battle. And they have these conversations and they're, they're very frank. Uh, and there's a, a situation where one of the warriors of the Drenai dies. Um, 
and uh, they go to the funeral in the Nadir camp, and the guys fraternize a little bit. It kind of reminded me of uh, in World War One, that, that one Christmas on the front lines when the two armies fraternized uh, over Christmas time because there had been a ceasefire forever, and both high commands freaked out and then pulled them away. But like, I, I'll never forget that. That's an amazing moment in, in like military history. But there's some of that in, in here, which I thought was really great. Uh, and I liked, there's a, I guess, double-sided coin to this. Um, I like, I, I'm a guy in my mid-50s, like I like reading about noble characters. Like I can't take a, a horribly cliched story about just everyone's a noble character and blah, blah, blah. But I do like reading about people who have character and, and who are noble and who will do the right thing, often will face death or embrace death, you know? Uh, and there's a lot of that in this book. A lot of the characters are very admirable people. So it's very enjoyable uh, to read about characters who like really want to do the right thing and they're willing to face death and so on and so forth. So I enjoyed that. Um, I think Gemmel's military research was sound, so he knows a lot about military tactics. So the things, all the things they have to do to prepare for the battle, like when Dress finally gets to the keep, He's like concerned about like training stretcher bearers and you're like, whoa, is like the ambulance corps, you know? So there are like those kind of really gritty details about how to prepare for a siege that are all over this book, which again, it really sets the tone for the book and um, sets all of the fantastic elements in a bed of really nice realism. Strangely enough, it was very put downable <laughs> for the first two thirds. Um, the book, and I would read a couple of chapters and I would be like, wow, this is a really good book. And I'm not really compelled to go further. <laughs> and I would go and do my thing and come back and read another couple of chapters. I really like these characters. So I had this odd experience of reading Legend where I really enjoyed it and thought it was really well done um, for, a, for a first novel. I'll get to my criticisms very soon. And at the same time, until the last two thirds of the book, uh, because it's very simple, I guess, in that they all come to the keep and prepare for the siege. So, you know, I, in these kinds of imaginative literatures, we're used to like, we gotta go here and get this thing, and then we go there, and then we discover this cavern, and then magic brings us here. There's usually more kind of geographical movement, right? The, the characters do a lot more things, they go places. Part of the pleasures of reading fantasy is kind of going through new vistas and discovering fantastic places and new beings and creatures. This is not that, and I think that may have led a bit to it. Uh, where it's like they're all just get, heading to the keep, and then when they're in the keep, they're preparing for battle. And it's the kind of the day-to-day -day issues of like, what men are we going to put on the wall? How are we going to defend this? You know, we, we got to train these guys. And it's it's interesting to read, and it's well done. But th I, there's like a lack of imaginative uh, sauce, I guess, in it that I, can, I think maybe put it down. And only when the battle kind of comes in earnest in the last two-thirds... Then I couldn't put the bloody book down. It was the first book I've kind of read past my weeknight bedtime in a long time. Uh, I had to finish the, la the last quarter of it. I was like, I have to find out how this ends. And a lot of it is because death plays a big role in the book. Um, and I'm not spoiling anything to say that half the characters that you come to know and love in this uh, book are not going to be around at the end. And that's wonderful because that just doesn't happen anymore. You know, in books where you know your first novel... You, you know, you, you probably sell a novel to a publisher, they buy your first three. You're not killing off anybody because the publisher's like, no, no, we want to get six books out of you, pal. So to have all these characters that you go into and you fully realize, and then a good number of them are not around anymore, I just, it was very refreshing and made the book have stakes in some way. So um, I enjoyed that very much. So my criticisms are these. Part of why I could put it down so easily is that even there were no stakes individually for the characters. Like Dross, he's coming back because the Earl called him. Uh, Vire is coming back because her father called him. And Rek is coming back because he loves Vire. The monks are coming back. Like, but really the author doesn't get across to you why it's so important that the Drenai civilization be saved or why Dross Delnok matters. I mean, it, it matters in a sense in the book because when it falls, pretty much... Um, they kind of have a free reign to kind of take over the rest of the empire. But there's something too big about that. The characters themselves, none of them have personal stakes in the victory. Um, as you get to know them, you want them to kind of, you, you, you care about them because of who they are. Uh, and, you know, what they're going to do in the battle. Not whether because you win. 
But like in Lord of the Rings, you damn well cared about whether Frodo was going to get the ring to Mount Doom or not. And because of Frodo and because of the world, like then Sauron gets the ring on his finger and it's curtains for everybody. It was a palpable fear that you had that was through everything in the book. So not that everything has to be Lord of the Rings, but it's just an example of like, you need to make the, the stakes of the world, you kind of have to bring it down to a very personal level to get you to buy in and, and uh, to the, the story. So I don't think he does that here. It's just like, there's a little too much flag waving of like, you know, we're all going to be noble for the, you know, and save the Draenei uh, Empire. Like, well, why? And who cares? And how is that related to you? So without that, I think that's why it was a little flat for me. Um, but at the end, once I really got to know all these characters, again, I, don't, I didn't really care about the bloody Draenei Empire. I just was curious if they were going to live or die in this one battle. So I didn't care if the Dross felt, fell, what that mattered, any of that. Um, so again, I think it was uh, as of th that... Gamal put everything he could into the realism and the characters, but it didn't feel, uh, I don't know, it, just, it, it wasn't, um, their stakes were never high enough for me until uh, they became high much later in the book. Uh, so again, I think that's tough when you're, when you're at the first half of a book and you don't feel like the characters really have personal stakes and stuff. You're like, all right, well, so that was kind of part of my criticism. <clears throat> Um, the relationships are very pat sometimes, like, characters are like, blah, 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 let's be friends. You know, it's very much like a young writer. Uh, Rec and Vire fall in love way too quickly, and it's very adolescent writing, their love affair, you know, it's very kind of goofy. Um, and a lot of things are done too quickly. Uh, he sets up scenes too quick, and then does the scenes, and they, they fall off. So I think as a young writer, like, he... I'm curious to go forward with him because I feel like I want to see what he does, how he matures. Because a lot of the book didn't feel, again, as deep and rich as maybe a, a fantasy book should feel. Because he was in and out of scenes a little too quick. And um, I just didn't feel that I was there. I didn't feel that the scene mattered so much. I felt like he kind of had to do some scenes for the story and then, then he hit it and quit it. So, again, uh, a little quickly... A little too pat and, and too shallow sometimes with the settings of the scenes. The final thoughts of this book. Uh, again, I was just blown away by how gritty it was. And, and not being super well-read in fantasy, it struck me that maybe this was in 1984. Um, and Glenn Cook's first Black Company book was 1984. And I feel like maybe these two guys were the first two kind of gritty military fantasy guys um, on the map. I don't know who had done it before then. I mean, Moorcock was dark. And obviously, you had the weird fantasy guys in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, Moorcock was kind of dark fantasy. Carl Edward Wagner was dark fantasy, right? I haven't read him yet. But this level of kind of grittiness, and I've read a little bit of Black Company. I haven't made it through the first one yet. Um, for whatever reason, I find Glenn Cook just hard to get into. But I was just blown away by this existed. And I was wondering, um, maybe that's why it never took on because I don't think Gemmo really caught on in the States. I don't think he's ever really been a big seller here. Uh, and I wonder because when he came up in the 80s, we were still in the midst of our heroic quest over here. We were still reading Eddings and Conan was, was you know, the Conan pastiche stuff was big. Uh, Jordan just started writing the Wheel of Time in the 90s. So like he was a little before his time, I feel like with, with stuff. Now. I feel like the fantasy world has caught up with him at this point. But um, I was really, really impressed with that. Um, and again, I, I think this book contains things that are still rare in the genre, um, in a sense, which are people who know really about war and about, you know, the grittiness of medieval settings and where you have real characters like the, the, the two farmers who are in battles. Like it just, you know, they didn't do much with them, but it just it added some realism. Um, also, the, uh, the real passion that he put into these characters and how they were not to type. Like, even though lots of them had heroic and noble characters, they weren't cliches, which was amazing, to be, be honest. I mean, maybe, maybe some of them were kind of cliche-ish, but they didn't feel like cliches to me. And I mean, I've read enough fantasy where if there's a cliche character, I'm like, okay, he's a cliche character. But I feel like he upended conventions, especially with Dross. I feel like he really upended the convention of, you know, this, the legend, this legendary warrior kind of character. Um, but yeah, and I mean, there were some, you know, he used modern words in there. there. There's some stuff in there that's like from a young writer, which I think adulterates the book a little bit and brings it down to like a B plus. 
but there's so much to like in it. And I'm really looking forward to reading more in the Draenei series because I think he's got a lot of strengths as an author. And I'm curious as he gets better uh, and continues to write, like what he's going to be like going down the line. So, uh, yeah, so that's my thoughts on David Gemmel's Legend and uh, looking forward to continuing. I think uh, The King Beyond the Gate is the next book in the series. So I'll probably pick that up at some point this year. Hopefully come back and talk about it. So um, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.